Welcome all and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Michael Downey and it's great to be back for another AWRI webinar. With pruning season nearly upon us and interstate travel restrictions still in place due to COVID-19, this year's pruning workforce across Australia may be a little different from usual. From it usual. And as such, the AWRI is presenting this webinar with a video demonstration on the basics of grapevine pruning to help support vineyard workers who may be new to pruning. Now, before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders for anyone that is new to AWRI webinars. To provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send it through. Also a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later via the AWRI's YouTube channel. Now, for those that have just joined, joined, welcome. Today's webinar provides an introduction to grapevine pruning and covers the two most common types, cane and, pr and spur pruning. Uh, it's fantastic to have Nick Dry from Foundation Viticulture joining us to outline these method, methods and explore the general principles associated with grapevine pruning. Nick brings a wealth of experience and knowledge, having managed Yalumba Nursery for 11 years before starting his own consulting business, Foundation Viticulture, in 2019. Nick, thank you for taking part today. It's fantastic to have your expertise on hand, and if you're ready to go, I'll hand over to you to make a start. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, hello and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Nick Dry and yes, I'm from Foundation Viticulture. And today I'm going to provide for you a beginner's guide to grapevine pruning. So the first thing I need to do is give you an outline of how today's session will proceed. So once I've finished the introduction, we'll play the video. And this video provides a visual illustration of the basic concepts of grapevine pruning, focused on the two most common methods of pruning, spur and cane pruning. The video will also take you through some other content to make you familiar with the grapevine and vineyards. Once the video has been completed, I'm gonna spend some time reviewing the content displayed in the video, essentially pausing at key points so that we can emphasize key learnings, expand on steps and provide a few tips. Because no two vineyard is the same, I'll also show you some before and after shots of other types of vines different to the vines in the video, which also use spur and cane pruning as a basis. At this point, we'll pause and open up to questions so that you don't have to wait until the very end of the webinar to ask the questions that are specific to the pruning methods we have learnt. After the first question time, I'm going to cover some secondary subjects that add to the first part of the session, such as keeping yourself healthy while pruning, keeping the vines healthy while we prune, equipment maintenance, and then I'll finish off with some explanations on why pruning is important in terms of how it can affect the amount of grapes the vine produces and the potential impacts of pruning on wine quality. Before we look at the video, um, I just want to say that for those of you out there who have never pruned before or haven't pruned for a while or may have never been in a vineyard, remember that this webinar will be posted on YouTube, as Michael said. So if at first watch it seems a little confusing, then you can always watch it again. And also, even if you watch it a few times, um, it will only be once you actually physically start pruning in the vineyard that this will all kind of make sense. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. Consider what you're about to watch as the foundation of which you will build on once you get out into the vineyard with a pair of snips in your hands. Um, I think at this point we're ready to play the video, Michael. So um, everyone sit back and relax and I'll talk to you again in about 13 minutes. Okay, thanks, Nick. I'm just pulling up the video for everyone. Um, for anyone that does experience issues with viewing this video via Zoom, I've also included a link to it in YouTube, which you should have received via chat. Um, so yes, 
you can also use that as an option. I'm going to play it now though. Welcome everyone, my name's Nick Dry and today I'm going to show you the basics of pruning a grapevine. In today's film we're going to cover the vine structure, why we prune, the equipment we need when we prune, and I'm going to finish by showing you the two most commonly used methods of pruning, spur and cane pruning. Before we enter any vineyard, we need to make sure that we are aware of the vineyard biosecurity protocols. Each vineyard will have different protocols, but the minimum requirement is to make sure you put your footwear through a chlorine foot bath and that you have thoroughly cleaned your snips with an ethanol solution. To start, let's talk about the different parts of the vine. The first thing you'll notice is that the vine is trained up and attached to a wire. This wire we refer to as the cordon wire or the fruiting wire. This wire gives the vine some structure and stops it from falling over. Here we have the trunk. This is the main thickened stem that grows up from the ground. Where the vine branches out, we call this area the head or the crown of the vine. This is the point where the vine branches out and forms what we refer to as the cordon. From the cordon, we have spurs growing up and out. And it's from these spurs, we have our canes growing out. On our canes, we have these swollen parts here and we call these nodes. And it's on the nodes that we have the buds. And then it's from the buds that we get the shoots and the fruit for next year. And if we look very closely here at the very base of this cane, we have the base bud. Pruning is the removal of canes. Here we can see a vine that's been half pruned using the spur pruning method. And I'll, I'll just make the last couple of cuts. And there we go. We can see a vine now that's been half pruned using spur pruning and now the unpruned section over here. And I'll just finish it off now. The other method of pruning is cane pruning. And to demonstrate the difference between cane and spur pruning, I've pruned half of this vine using the cane pruning method and the other half of the vine using the spur prune method. Now, this is not something we would do in the vineyard, but I just want to demonstrate the difference. So here we have our fruiting cane wrapped to the wire, hence cane pruning. And here we have our spurs on our permanent cordon, hence spur pruning. In this module today, we'll demonstrate both methods of pruning. We'll use the vines here in the Barossa to demonstrate spur pruning, and then we'll jump up to the Adelaide Hills to demonstrate cane pruning. There are two main reasons why we prune. The first reason is to give the vine its shape and structure. If we didn't prune, the vines would continue to grow upwards and outwards and would be very difficult to manage. The second reason why we prune is that it allows us to control the amount of fruit that the vine produces. Very simply, the more wood we remove, the lower the yield of fruit. And now it's time to prune, but what equipment do we need? Well, today with me, I have my snips or secateurs or shears or whatever you like to call them. I've got a holster for my snips. Over here, I've got loppers, which we use for any larger pruning cuts. To keep these bits of equipment sharp, I've got a sharpening stone, and then to keep me safe in the vineyard, I've got gloves for my hands, protective glasses for my eyes, and a fluoro jacket to keep me visible in the vineyard. Now, it's important to know that there are different types of snips. The biggest difference is if they are hand or electric. If you're pruning a large area, electric snips are preferred as they take a lot of pressure off of your hands, but they are more expensive to purchase and maintain. Today, as you've seen, I'm using the simple hand snips. Pruning is a physical job and occurs during the cold of winter. Even if you're using electric snips, it's still very important to warm up your hands and your back with some simple stretches before you make a start. 
First, I'm going to demonstrate spur pruning. Now, when you're spur pruning an established vine, unless you've been otherwise advised, the best thing to do is to follow the pattern or the existing structure of the spurs that are already in, in place. Now, if we have a look closely, we can see that we've got the spur that was left last year, and these are the two fruiting canes that grew from the two buds on that spur. Now, what we can also see is that there is a colour difference between the two-year-old wood, which is normally a more grey colour, and this newer one-year-old wood, which tends to be more of a golden brown in colour. What I'm going to do first is cut each of these canes that arise from the spur back to a two-bud spur. And also remove any canes that have grown from anywhere that is not a spur, like this one here. So if we left the vine like this, it would be essentially doubling the number of buds that we left on the vine compared to last year. So we now have to go back through and cut each double spur back to a single two bud spur. Where possible, we want to select the lowest spur. If we continue to select the highest spur year on year, then the spur height will continue to grow and the vine will lose its structure and be more difficult to manage. The exception to the lowest spur rule is if the lowest cane is weak, like this one here, or it might be damaged due to the machine harvesting, or it could be disease. So in this case, I'm going to cut this lowest one out that's weak, and I'm going to spur this one here. So here we have the vine pruned to two bud single spurs. This time, rather than pruning everything back to double spurs and then selecting my single spurs, I'm going to go straight to selecting my single spurs, which is the most efficient way of pruning. Here we simply make one cut through the top of last year's spur, effectively removing the top cane and then we trim the cane of the lowest bud to create our two bud spur. As we remove the canes, we generally like to toss them into the middle of the row so that they can either be mulched by the tractor or cleaned up with a rake. It's important to recognise that when we cut our two bud spur, we don't count the base bud because the base bud is less likely to produce a shoot and if it did, it is unlikely to grow any fruit on that shoot. The rule of thumb for telling the difference between the base bud and the first bud is that if the bud is higher than 5mm from the base of the spur, then it should be classified as the first bud. Any bud lower than 5mm is classified as a base bud. Finally, we want to finish by cleaning the vine up, removing any canes that have not grown from spurs and then cutting off any canes that arise from the trunk. And here we have the finished vine. Many vineyards use a pre-pruning machine to cut off the shoots at approximately 30 centimetres high, which helps for more efficient and safer pruning. The vines look like this, but the method of pruning is just the same. So here we are in the Adelaide Hills to demonstrate cane pruning. Because cane pruned vines are set up differently to spur pruned vines, let's have a look at the vine before it's pruned. Here is the cane that was wrapped down last season and the shoots that grew from that cane. And we have another cane on this side of the vine. And again, the shoots that grew from that cane. We call these canes the fruiting canes. And these grew from 
replacement spurs here and here. And unlike the spurs on a spur prune vine, these spurs are located below the fruiting wire. The whole idea of cane pruning is to select and wrap down a new fruiting cane for either side of the vine every season and also to select and leave one or two replacement spurs. These replacement spurs will produce the fruiting canes for next season. Before we make any cut, it's important that we identify this year's two fruiting canes, remembering that these will arise from last year's replacement spurs. So here and here. Next, we can identify the canes that will become this year's replacement spurs. So here and here. Now we can move on to removing last year's fruiting canes from the wire. This is best achieved by making two major cuts on either side of the crown and then cutting through last year's shoots. The tendrils that keep the shoots in place in the growing season can also make it difficult to remove the cane, so often need to be cut to allow easier removal. Then, being very careful not to cut the new fruiting canes or replacement spurs, we can completely remove all the other canes. Now it's a matter of cutting this year's fruiting cane to size and wrapping it onto the wire. It's really important when wrapping down a cane onto the fruiting wire that we're not putting too much stress onto the base of the cane. We just want to gently ease it around onto the wire and if it doesn't stay on the wire, we can always use a zip tie to keep it in place. Now we prune the replacement spurs back to two buds. And there we have it, two new fruiting canes and two new replacement spurs. As with spur pruning, no two vines look alike and sometimes the canes on the replacement spurs are weak or damaged or in a position that does not allow them to be wrapped down. This is why it is critical that the preferred fruiting canes are identified before any cuts are made, just in case you need to use an alternative fruiting cane to those coming from the replacement spurs. Okay, we're going to wait about 30 seconds or so to allow anyone that jumped out of the webinar to watch that demonstration in YouTube to rejoin. So Nick, I'll just get you to hold off um, for about 30 seconds before we restart. Mm -hmm. um, just a reminder that that video will also be available to view as three separate videos on the AWRI's YouTube channel. Um, they'll be released as soon as this webinar has finished. And we'll also be circulating a link following this webinar where you can access those. All right, Nick, I think we're ready to recommence if you're set to go. Yep, sure thing, Michael, thank you. Um, so welcome back everyone. Um, okay, so now you've seen the video, we're gonna spend some time reviewing spur and cane pruning by looking at some still shots from key points in the video so that we can really have a close look at the concepts that were discussed, slow things down. Um, and then I'll also expand on some of these concepts using photos from other vineyards. So again, let's start with spur pruning. So, in the film, I explain that when spur pruning, you should follow the pattern of the existing spurs. And you can hopefully see the pattern of the spurs in the photo highlighted 
by the arrows. Um, we were fortunate in, uh, in the filming process to have access to some well-maintained vines with nice evenly spaced spurs, uh, very few long gaps in the cordon and very few canes not arising from deliberately left spurs. It's not always the case. Uh, in some vineyards, the pattern may not be as obvious. And so you'll need to work closely with the vineyard supervisor or manager to understand how many buds or spurs per vine they would like to keep. Um, in this scenario here, um, when choosing your spur positions, make sure you ask the questions of the supervisor or vineyard manager about the preferred spacing between the spurs. And a typical answer might be, you know, hand width or the width of your snips, or they might give you some sort of um, measurement to work with. Another consideration is the orientation of the spurs. So we want to avoid all the buds from the spurs growing in the same direction as this will end up crowding the fruit zone leading to potential problems with disease and wine quality. The next concept was the lowest spur rule. So here we've got a close up of a spur that was left last winter with the two canes that grew out of the two, two buds that were retained last year. When pruning, remember that we want to create a new spur from the lower of the two canes to prevent spur height from growing too high too quickly. And to do this, we cut through last year's spur along the red dotted line to remove the highest cane. And then to create our spur for this year, it's a matter of identifying the two buds on the lower cane and then cutting along the dotted line to create our spur for this season. Uh, and then you have uh, the, the final spur. Um, you can't really see the different buds in this shot. So here is a better shot uh, that shows the different buds, the placement of the different buds with the base bud. Um, and then to make the two bud spur in this instance, uh, we would make cuts along the dotted lines here and here. So taking off that uh, top shoot and then spurring the bottom shoot. Of course, there's always exceptions in life. And um, the next concept is the exception to the lowest spur rule. Um, so if the cane that would potentially create the lowest spur is weak or damaged, then it is recommended that the top cane be used to create the spur. And so a cut along here and here, as indicated, uh, would be made to make that two bud spur. The next concept is that is talking about count and non-count shoots. So I didn't explain in the video, but um, in viticulture, any cane or shoot that grows from a bud that was deliberately left last season is called a count shoot, as in we are counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So canes or shoots that grow from buds that were not deliberately left last season are called non-count shoots. And these need to be removed. They can grow from anywhere on the vine, including the, including the trunk. And in some vineyards, there are a lot of non-count shoots to remove. Um, here's an example of two non-count shoots um, that need to be cut out from the bottom of the cordon. Um, and it's really important that when we remove non-count shoots that the cut is flat against the cordon. Um, otherwise, buds remain and it grows back next season and you just need to repeat the process. So it's really important to get nice and close to the cordon to remove all of those buds. Okay, so that's just a quick re review of spur pruning. Um, we're gonna move on to cane pruning. And remember, um, write down any questions because we're gonna pause at the end of this little first session um, uh, for a question time, okay? so. Moving on to cane pruning. So when we're cane pruning, the most important thing is to uh, identify the new fruiting canes before we make any cuts. If two replacement spurs were left last year, there should be two canes on either side of the vine to choose from. Um, and when selecting these fruiting canes, they need to meet a few criteria. So when you're sitting there looking at the vine, ask yourself uh, these questions. The first question is, is the cane in a position to easily wrap onto the wire? Um, in this photo on the, uh, in the middle, um, you can see the two, two canes arising from the replacement spur. The cane on the right is oriented 
coming towards us, towards the, the pruner, and it's away from the fruiting wire. And so we would need to bend it back and around uh, so as to wrap it onto the fruiting wire. And, you know, apart from taking extra time to wrap down, there's also a really good chance that we're going to snap it at the base in the process. Um, certainly the cane, so this cane is better off as the replacement spur. Uh, while the cane on the left, which is pointing directly at the fruiting wire and was much simpler to wrap down, is an ideal fruiting cane. The next question is, to ask, is the cane healthy and undamaged? Um, diseased canes tend to be either bleached or covered in black soot. And actually in this very dry season that we've just had, it was hard to find um, any diseased canes. That was as good as I could get. Um, healthy canes are a nice golden brown color. And obviously look closely at the whole length of the cane to make sure that it's not damaged anywhere. I've obviously used a really um, damaged cane in that photo, but yeah, make sure there's no scarring or nicks in the cane anywhere. The final question, is the cane too thick? Uh, thicker in this case is not better. Uh, any cane thicker than around 12 mils um, in diameter should be discounted because any cane this thick will tend to have long spaces between the buds, which means you will end up wrapping down less buds than you want. And so if the canes arising from the replacement spurs do not meet these criteria, then you might need to look at other options around the cane, around the crown from non-count shoots or one of the first shoots arising from last year's fruiting cane. And this is why it comes back to that fundamental. You really must make clear identification of your new fruiting canes with those desirable attributes before you make any cuts. Now, uh, remember that replacement spurs should be below the fruiting wire and ideally positioned one on either side of the vine so that the canes arising from those spurs are easy to wrap down next year. And when it comes to removing last year's shoots or canes, don't undo your good work in identifying this year's fruiting canes by accidentally cutting them. I've done this more times than I'd like to admit and it's you know, obviously counterproductive. When pulling canes out from the wire, trim the tendrils. This makes for much easier removal. And finally, be mindful of yourself and those around you when pulling out the canes, as a cane slap to the face is a very unpleasant experience, especially on a cold winter's morning. And so the final concept of cane pruning in this review is wrapping down. When wrapping down, hold the base of the cane to make sure you don't put too much stress on this weak point. If you're not gentle, then the cane may snap. In some cases, you may need to crack the cane to get it to curve into position. Now, this is a gentle process done using two hands together, shuffling up the cane using very light flexing or cracking to create the curve. And finally, don't cut your replacement spurs until you successfully wrap down your fruiting canes, just in case you snap one. The replacement spur then becomes your replacement cane. Now, for a whole variety of reasons, the vines that you will encounter will not always fall neatly into the two categories we've already covered. And what I'm going to do in the next section is show you two different looking vines that use spur and cane pruning methods as the basis for pruning. The first is what we call the two wire cane pruned. And this is simply cane pruning, but instead of two fruiting canes wrapped down onto a single fruiting wire, there is now an extra fruiting wire with two additional canes. There's also the requirement for an additional two replacement spurs. The principles of cane pruning are the same in that you need to first identify your fruiting canes with the preferred attributes, then identify your replacement spurs, and of course, be careful not to cut your new fruiting canes when removing last year's wood from the wire. Here is an example of what's called a double cordon spur pruned. And as with the previous example, this is just like normal spur pruning, except that when you have two cordons instead of one, employ the spur pruning, princ spur pruning principles just the same as if there was one cordon. Uh, here's the vine after pruning, and I've highlighted the spurs as they're a bit hard to see. 
The only extra consideration compared with single cordon spur pruning is that you may be asked to cut new spurs on the bottom cordon from non-count shoots as double cordon vines tend to favour growth into the top cordon and hence new spurs on the bottom cordons can help keep the vine balanced. Before we get into question time, I just wanted to share some tips that, I've, uh, that I always hear from experienced pruners. The first one is to take a step back and look at the vine before you start pruning. Taking a mental note of the pattern of spurs, the spacing, the general look of the vine, and also identifying any gaps or problems that, that may need to be addressed. The second tip is to, to look ahead while you're pruning. Don't just focus on what is immediately in front of you because if you know what is coming up along the cordon, you can make better decisions with what's directly in front of you. And finally, if you ever come to a point on the vine where you're unsure about what to do next with the next, you know, the next spur or whatever decision you need to make, take another step back and have another look at the whole vine and think about the bigger, bigger picture of what you're trying to achieve and then go back and complete the vine. Okay, so now that we've reviewed the concepts of spur and cane pruning, I'm happy to take some questions on these two methods. Okay, thanks Nick for running through the first part of your presentation. As Nick's already indicated, we will um, take a moment to pause here and address any questions that the audience currently has. Um, just a reminder to ask a question, please open the Q&A button in your Zoom toolbar and send it through. Type it in and send it through rather. Um, we've got a few questions that have come through already, Nick. Um, you mentioned that in cane pruning, you can leave one or two replacement spurs. As a general rule, if there is two available, should you always leave two? And the second part of this question is also, should you only leave one replacement spur on each side of the head? Yeah, it's a good question. It probably comes down to um, an individual decision on the capacity of the vine. So um, if you've got a younger vine with lower capacity, so lower, um, let's call it, I'm going to go into capacity in the next section, but um, yeah, with lower capacity, then you may only want to use or leave one replacement spur. Um, with larger vines with greater capacity, then there is the potential to leave two replacement spurs on either side. Um, so yeah, where you might have a more established vine. Okay, also got a question here about whether you're aware of any resources um, that people can use to, um, to act as checklists or decision maps for anyone that's new to, to pruning. Um, I haven't actually come across anything, um, but what we might do is I might do some further research and see if there's anything uh, currently available. But I, I agree that it, it would be a good um, a good resource because there is, a, I guess, a, a pattern of thinking that goes into pruning um, uh, uh, that would certainly um, assist in some of that decision making. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Um, are you also able to talk a little bit about pruning 20 year old vines that have cordon fatigue due to tight wrapping when they were young? Um, I go on. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a challenge. I mean, trying to get a cordon uh, off of a wire where essentially the, the cordon has grown around the wire is, is a big challenge. Um, I can actually see the question there. So it's asking whether to uh, use, do, 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 yeah, do we leave a spur on the trunk to begin a new cane to wrap down next year? If one is available. Um, but I guess the other thing to consider when doing that is to take the Utipa, um infection into account. So you need to make sure that where that spur may be sitting, there isn't um, Utipa in the trunk nearby because then all you'll be doing is just training up a new shoot um, from that spur that may have Utipa. So uh, you'd really need to make sure of that. And then if that's the case, if you can see Utipa um, just above where that spur is sitting, then yes, you might need to go down lower and, and, and cut it off you know, uh, further down and then wait for some, um, some water shoots to grow up. Um, from below where that Utipa infection may be. Okay, thanks. Um, can you also speak to when or how you'd make the decision to choose spur or cane printing method? 
Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so um, there's there's a number of factors and it is very much a region by region or vineyard by vineyard decision and also varietally speaking as well. So um, the first thing to consider is the fact that uh, cane pruning is more expensive than spur pruning. It's, it's a slower method. Um, we also consider um, the potential for using cane pruning if you want to renew your cordon every year. So if you're in a region where you, or you have a variety that is susceptible to trunk disease, you may want to renew your cordon every year. Um, and there's also some consideration around um, the fruitfulness of um, the lower bud. So when you're spur pruning, you're obviously leaving the two lower buds um, on the basis that they will be fruitful. So they will produce shoots that produce bunches. Um, and depending on either the variety or um, the climatic conditions or the, you know, the, the, the general situation you're in, the fruitfulness of those lower two buds may not be there. So therefore you may need to consider laying down a cane with buds obviously all the way along that cane. Okay. Um, some of the fruiting wires seem to be very high off the ground. Can you explain why this is the case? Um, I'm wondering if that refers to the double cordon, um, the double cordon scenario. Um, look, there could be a number of reasons why you might have fruiting wires that are higher off the ground. Um, there might be some issues to do with um, frost. So the higher up you are, the lower the level, the degree of frost. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, it's a vineyard by vineyard case. It's hard to be specific. Sure. Um, also got a question here around someone wanting to know when there's cane disease, um, you just remove the, the cane or is it necessary to use some chemicals? Um, look, I, I think at that point in the season, um, I mean, if, if you've got disease in your canopy post harvest, then there is the opportunity to try and um, remediate this by using some fungicide sprays. Uh, by the time you get to pruning, um, realistically, you'd just be you just be pruning them out rather than um, doing any sprays at that point. Sure. And where do you recommend cutting through the replacement cane for tying down? Um, so you can go through um, the bud, so the the, the terminal bud. Um, and then that will actually give you something to, you know, if you're using a, a tie, a zip tie, for instance, then that'll stop the zip tie from, from coming up. Um, you know, most, most experienced printers that I talk to don't like to see uh, canes overlapping. So they want to see from uh, the, the terminal bud on one vine next to the terminal bud on the other vine. They want to see a space of a, say, about a hand width between those two those two buds. So there's not, um, there's not a, it, it, that will avoid any um, crowding at that point. Okay. We've also got a question here around old vines. Potentially the question is around whether or vines that have got cane and spur together. Mm -hmm. I presume that's what he's addressing. Can you speak to someone yeah. around that issue? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it really depends, again, on the scenario. Um, there's no real reason why you can't have uh, a, a combination of spurs and some canes if you've actually got a, a you know, a fruiting wire. Um, and this is more likely to be a scenario like, a, I guess, a, a bush vine where you've got, rather than a cordon um, trained spur pruned, you've got head trained spur pruned, um, and then you may have some canes that you're training um, then up onto the fruiting wire um, as well. So realistically, there's no, there's no right or wrong in the way you're pruning. It's sort of coming back to the principles of making sure that um, you've got some spacing between your spurs and, and you're not creating, or, or your buds, and you're not creating a crowding um, situation, but also the opportunity avoiding um, uh, uh, still being able to manage the vine. So making sure that spurs aren't growing outwards into the rows, which makes it difficult for machinery to go into or growing upwards as well. Okay. Um, I've got quite a number of additional questions that have come through. I might 
do one more, Nick, and then we'll jump back into your presentation and see if we can address these at the end of the session. So the final one would be, it's a quick one, how long should the canes be? Um, well, um, you want to maximise your, your, your fruiting wire. Or, um, so there's no point, in my view, and this all comes down to vine capacity and balance as well, but there's no point um, wasting space on your wire. So you really want to make sure that um, your, your canes are joining up from one vine to the next with a hand space between the buds. And, you know, a, a simple rule of thumb is when you're selecting your cane, get a feel for what that means in terms of the length down your arm. And so if you've got a nicely balanced vine, the length of your arm will typically give you somewhere between eight to 10 buds, which would mean that you're laying down between, you know, 16 and if you're just doing, you know, one cane either side, somewhere between 16 and 20 um, uh, buds per vine, or if you're doing, you know, double canes, then you double that again. Sure. Okay. Let's jump back in and um, continue with the presentation and we'll mm -hmm. um, address these questions at the end. Sure thing. Okay, so just moving on. So these are some secondary um, subjects. So we all know that staying fit and healthy on the job is a joint responsibility of the employer and you, the employee. So it's important we take some time to talk about staying healthy while pruning. So firstly, I've included a link to a fact sheet prepared um, by AWRI on COVID-19 health and safety protocols for vineyard workers. Next, I'd like to remind you of the PPE or the personal protective equipment that you should use. So in the video, I was wearing glasses and gloves and high visibility clothing. And this isn't necessarily PPE, but don't forget waterproof footwear because it's a long and very uncomfortable day if your feet are soaking wet. Plus, it's a sure way to get sick. Um, don't forget that pruning is physical. So warm up before you start the day and also after smoker and lunch. And I'm talking about hands and your back and any other part of the body that is moving. It is physical. You should be moving around bending as you prune. So make sure you warm up before you get out there. Um, and finally, if you're suffering from ongoing pain in any part of the body after a day of pruning, make sure you report this to your supervisor. Early intervention is best. One of the biggest causes of injury is blunt or poorly maintained snips. So equipment maintenance is critical. So for daily maintenance, with this, this is with hand snips, um, use a cleaning product to remove sap from the blades. In the past, I've used something like orange rind oil, which is a, which is a nice um, safe product. And that'll just uh, remove the, the sap um, from the blades. If it doesn't come off, then um, you can always use a wire brush or a scourer, but you know, realistically, your snip blade doesn't need to be perfectly clean. Um, once you've cleaned it, then make sure you're regularly sharpening the cutting blade edge with the sharpening stone. And you should be doing this at least daily. And in some vineyards, um, especially if you're, you might be, uh, there might be an old uh, fruiting wire there or a fruiting wire that you might be just um, accidentally nicking occasionally. Um, and you'll be losing the edge on the blade if you do that. Or if, you know, some varieties are certainly harder than others, the wood is harder than others. So you may need to find, or you may find that you need to be sharpening your blades more regularly. And finally, of course, keep your, the mechan mechanism lubricated. Um, and depending on the age and the wear of your snips, you, you also might need to undertake more intense maintenance throughout the season. Um, I found a couple of links on YouTube for maintenance of hand snips um, for daily and then less regular maintenance when you're literally pulling, um, pulling the snips apart and um, giving them a, a thorough clean and um, maintain. For electric snips, um, just go to the manufacturers um, for, um, you know, specific information on how to maintain electric snips. Again, YouTube is a good resource. Um, there's there's an, a range, I, I saw a, a range of um, videos um, for electric snips from, I think it was Electric Hoop. Um, so yeah, jump on YouTube for any uh, specific information from manufacturers on maintaining electric snips. 
So just as important as it is to keep ourselves healthy and our equipment maintained, uh, we also must consider the grapevines that we're pruning because when we prune, we're essentially creating a wound. Um, and so to limit the risk of having any pathogens or disease entering the vine at pruning, it's best to avoid pruning during the rain because rain triggers the release of spores and it's these spores that infect the vine and make it sick. Um, the other thing to consider is that uh, the bigger the pruning wound you create, the greater the surface area for a spore to land on. So you might find that your vineyard supervisor will ask you to paint over any large wounds with a, with a special um, fungicidal paint. Um, and of course, always clean your pruning tools when moving between blocks and vineyards. Um, there's some excellent research on keeping vines healthy at pruning, um, and they can be found at these links here. Um, the first one is, uh, is I guess, a more comprehensive, um, uh, more, compre more comprehensive document, whereas the, the one below, it's a bit more of a um, specific fact sheet around um, healthy pruning. The, you also uh, need to remind you that you've got a responsibility to not bring any pests or disease onto the vineyard you're pruning. So make sure you inform the employer or where you've been um, previously working. Follow the instructions on where to park. Don't go parking in the vineyard. Park on hard services. And make sure you turn up to the vineyard with clean boots and clean equipment. And then don't go and remove any parts of the vine or the soil from the vineyard and take it to the next vineyard. Keep everything in place. Okay, and again, um, there's a good fact sheet from Vine Health Australia there to, um, to get some, some further information on. So just to finish the webinar, I'd like to introduce the concept of vine capacity, which will hopefully help you understand why pruning is important in the context of getting the right yield of fruit and grape quality. Um, just like us humans, every vine is individual and has a different capacity to do work. And capacity of an individual vine is dependent on the vine age, the health of the vine and the soil type and how much water and nutrition it's given. Between different vineyards and even sometimes within a vineyard, capacity can be significantly different um, between vines. And so we need to ensure that yield and quality is maximised. So we need to therefore... Um, consider the number of buds that need to be retained and whether this needs to be adjusted. Um, and it's really the job of the vineyard manager or the viticulturist to work this out and then they should communicate it to whoever's pruning. So capacity is constant whereas weight of grapes produced or canes produced is manipulated by pruning. Put very simply, if we leave too many buds, then the vine will produce too much fruit and not enough shoot length. And as a consequence, the vine might not be able to ripen all the fruit that it's produced, which therefore has you know, quality can, um, implications. If we leave too few buds, then there may be too few grapes and all the vine's capacity will go into producing shoots. Uh, and this will result in too much shading of the fruit and again, potentially poor quality wine. So I hope that gives you some insight into the importance of cane, uh, the importance of pruning. Um, and again, it's really just an introduction into the concept of, of vine capacity. Um, that's all I've got for you today. Uh, as I stated in, in the introduction of the webinar, um, this will be posted on YouTube. So you can always review any concepts that you're unclear on. Um, and remember that it's once you actually get into the vineyard that this will all, all make a lot more sense. So. Uh, good luck, and I'm happy to take any final questions. Okay. Thanks very much, Nick. So we will try and get through some of these final questions that we've already had come through. The first one is around um, unbalanced vines with a strong and weak side. What do you suggest in those types of scenarios? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so with a strong and a weak side, what is the best method for balancing these out? These, these out? Um, what you might need to do is um, consider removing the cordon of the weak side and then laying down a new, um, a, a new cordon. So leaving a replacement spur somewhere near the fruiting wire and then laying this down. But I guess the real question you need to ask is why 
is it weak on that side? Does it have some sort of trunk disease? Um, is there some sort of impediment of, of flow to that side? Um, and so, yeah, any decisions you, you make needs to be around, you know, really what, what's causing um, that weak side. Because realistically, um, if, if it was with a healthy vine, there shouldn't be a strong and a weak side. There should be um, balance between the two. Sure. Um, so what do you need to consider when um, you're weighing up whether a vine's been hand or machine harvested with regard to pruning? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So if you have a, say, a machine harvested vine, you need to make sure that, I guess, the, the pruning is tighter to the cordon because any high, um, high spurs or any spurs that are coming out the side, there's definitely the risk of those being um, damaged as the machine harvester goes over the top of it. So, yeah, certainly with machine harvesting, um, you'd want to make sure that your, your, your spurs remain, you know, pretty close to that cordon so you don't damage, um, so that you don't damage them. Um, with hand harvesting, there's probably not so much to think about in terms of pruning you know you can you can look at maybe spreading them out a bit further and that way it's a little bit easier to get in and around and, and find the bunches so you've probably got a bit more to play with there sure there's been a number of questions around wound painting to control disease do you have any um anything further to add around how to how to best manage that oh, look that um the the link to the uh when i was talking about i'll just go back if I can, to this top link here on um, grapevine trunk disease is an excellent document and will answer realistically any questions um, a lot better than I can about um, wound painting. Sure. Um, with cane pruning, how large should the gap be between adjacent canes when wrapping on the cordon wire? Um, again, I think we're talking about from one vine to the next. Uh, when can, uh, yeah, so I would, you gotta, be, it's not so much where the canes finish, it's where the terminal buds finish. So the canes can be butted against each other so long as there's a nice, you know, sort of hand width gap between the terminal buds. So when those buds shoot, we're not creating um, a, a crowded situation. Okay. Um... In cane pruning, does the replacement spur become the new growth for the next year? And then the following year, that new growth is cut and the growth from the last year, which you had cut, is now the replacement spur. So a couple yeah. of questions there. Yeah, that's right. So what you're aiming to do, the, the, when you're leaving that replacement spur, you're doing that deliberately because the, the canes, the shoots of the canes that grow from that replacement spur will be the options for the new fruiting canes to lay down next year. And then it's, it's, just, it's just continual renewal. So um, we then, so you lay one of those down as your fruiting cane for, and then you can spur off the other one and that becomes next year's replacement spur. Um, so in a really nicely balanced vineyard, that's, you know, it's really just, laying new fruiting canes down, spurring off your replacement spur, two shoots grow from your replacement spur, choosing one through fruiting cane, spurring that as your replacement spur and on and on it will go. Yep. Um, when's the best time to remove a sacrificial cane in high vigor vineyards? Ooh, um, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, you'd need to understand what sort of yield potential. So obviously you leave a sacrificial cane potentially because you're trying to, gives you a bit of options for, um, for yield management. So, um, and then if it's not necessary for yield manager, it's for trying to decrease vigor, then you'd really need to um, get to a point where the bunch is developing on that sacrificial cane and therefore taking vigor away from the rest of the, the vine. Um, but you wouldn't wanna be leaving it on there so long that that sacrificial cane um, and the bunch that's growing is actually then taking 
uh, nutrients or, or anything away from, you know, growing um, quality or producing a, you know, like shading. So look, I mean, you're probably looking to remove it either um, just before or just after Verizon, but I'll probably be leaning to um, just before Verizon. Sure. Um, are you able to recommend any good exercises or resources that people can visit um, to help avoid RSI type injuries? Yeah, that's a, a real, I, I spent a bit of time looking online for something specific to pruning and I, and I couldn't find anything specific. You know, really um, it's about making sure that, you know, like I, I know when you're hand pruning, um, if you know that you're going to be hand pruning in a week or, a, or two or three weeks, I know that a lot of back in the day when there was a lot more hand pruning rather than electric pruning, people would strengthen their wrist before pruning season by um, squeezing like a stress ball or um, actually doing some, some physical strengthening before the start of pruning season. Um, but in terms of actual specific warm up sheets, um, I couldn't find anything. Um, but I think that's something that we'll, we'll take um, take away and we'll see if um, there's the potential to perhaps develop something that can be um, given out to industry. Yeah, sure. Um, question here about how fast would someone be expected to prune a spur trained and a cane trained vine? Yeah, um, look, it's definitely, you know, cane pruning takes a lot longer than spur pruning it's i wouldn't say it's necessarily um double but it might be you know sort of one and a half times and again it really depends on and i hate to sort of sit on the fence but if the if, if the vineyard's been um, pre-pruned as we showed in the video that is a lot quicker to prune than something where the canes are all in place you know that you almost half the amount of time it takes to prune because you're not pulling canes out um, so it is real and you know you've got different vines with you know the more count shoots that need to be trimmed or cut off that increases the amount of time so look i, I really can't give you a, an absolute um sure. time figure there sorry um got a question here about just let me find it whether you might be able to outline some of the more common mistakes that the beginners often make yeah, um, look, you certainly hear stories of um, vines being pruned back to rather than the one-year-old wood, but being pruned back to two-year-old wood. So it's really important that you make that distinction between what's one-year-old and then what's two-year-old and then what's three-year-old and older. And that what we're doing is we, we want to prune back to that one-year-old wood. That's probably the, the first major mistake. Um, I think it's it's not so much a mistake, but understand that like anything, pruning is it's a bit of an an art form, and it takes time. Like when I go back to pruning, it takes me a while to get back in the rhythm of things and 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 really seeing what I need to do. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. Um, it, it could take you know a day or two or a week or two weeks before you really feel comfortable out in the vineyard with the decisions that you're making. So. Don't think that you, no one's going to expect you to be an expert straight away. I've also got a question here about whether variety plays a role in whether you would choose to cane or spur prune. Um, yes, it does. Some varieties um, are more fruitful um, or less fruitful, I should say, um, than others uh, in the first um, two buds. So um, that's definitely the case. Um, uh, I'd have to go back and have a look at um, some notes to give you examples there. But yeah, it, there's definitely a difference in fruitfulness between varieties. Yep. Um, there's been quite a few questions about um, vine balance um, and how yep. to best manage that when you're pruning. Do you yep. want to spend a, a little bit of time just talking about that, Nick? Yeah, I, I, um, I didn't really want to go too much into, you know, some of those more technical sure um, areas but yeah in terms of vine balance well it's really where what we're trying to do is obviously find that when we talk about vine balance we're talking about the balance of you know fruit 
to you know shoot growth so making sure that we've got enough leaf area that we're able to ripen the fruit um, and that essentially is determined by how many buds that we we leave um, every vineyard will have a i guess a, a you know a, what we're trying to target in terms of a bud number but that takes some time and understanding of the vineyard to actually find that bud number so um, the best way to to look at it is if you know, go out to the vineyard um, once before you start pruning and once the leaves have fallen and, and have a look at um, where shoots are arising from. So if you've got a lot of, you know, short shoots, spindly growth um, and, um, and uh, count buds that haven't pushed, then you're probably in a situation where you've left too many buds. And so you've got a, a, um, a low amount of uh, leaf area to, to fruit weight um, and you know probably next year you probably want to leave um, a few less buds so that you can get a bit more shoot weight um, and get that vine back into balance and then um, the opposite that would of that would be if you look at the vine uh, before you prune it and there's a lot of non-count shoots so shoots growing um, not from spurs or from the canes that you left last year um, you could make the argument that um, that vine, you've left too few buds on it. So there's more growth going into shoot growth um, uh, than you'd like. And therefore, you've got some issues with, you know, potentially shading and uh, going into a, into a vigor cycle. So definitely be informed by the way the vines look before pruning. Um, you know, there's other things you can do. You can take pruning weights and, and compare them against the, the fruit weight. And there's some ratios that you can use there. But um, I think just having a look at the vines before you prune um, will certainly give you a, a really good starting point to determine whether you need to adjust your bud numbers up or down to get the vines into balance. Sure. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I've also got a question here about pruning in the rain. Is there anything that people need to be aware of if they are doing that? Well, you know... Ideally, you want to avoid pruning in the rain because that's when spores are released. Um, so again, I, I'd, I, you know, this is a whole subject matter in itself, but I'll definitely go and have a look at that grapevine trunk disease um, uh, uh, document um, that's up on the screen at the moment. Uh, and that will give you um, some really good background information for you to make, make decisions on uh, whether you should prune in the rain, and if you do, what you should do to limit your risk of infection. Sure. Uh, I've got a question about replacing cordons. I'm not sure if you addressed that already or not. Uh, replacing cordons. So would that be... Uh, where, where is that question? Yeah, there's not a lot of information there. Uh, what about replacing cordons? Damien. Hello, Damien. Um, well, I guess it depends on the scenario. Um, Look, uh, uh, very generally, we seem to see more where I am in the Barossa Valley, we're seeing more vineyards being cane pruned to replace cordons um, or, you know, for that annual cordon renewal. And I would think that that is to do with um, limiting, you know, risks of uterine infection in permanent cordons. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, if you want to spend the time in the vineyard, then um, it, it's a good practice to, to limit um, grapevine trunk disease. As long as you make sure that you're not, when you're creating those big, big wounds, um, converting over to, um, you know, fruiting canes, that you are uh, making sure that you control those wounds with, you know, with paint, etc. Okay, another question here about what pruning method you would recommend um, for vines that you got new grafts with a new variety new grafts yeah um what pruning um uh good question i mean once you get it up to the wire then the first thing you're going to do anyway is you're going to cane essentially put down a fruiting cane anyway so any really any young vine establishment starts with um with a fruiting cane being laid down I think the important thing at that point is just to make sure that um, you find a way to top tie that young vine. Um, once you've laid that, don't rely on that fruiting cane to give the vine structure because you probably end up with a bowed trunk. 
And then after that, I think you could probably, you know, make your decision on whether you want to spur it, um, either spur prune or, or cane prune after that. Sure. Um, I've also got a question about how to remove a cordon from the wire. Um, that really depends on how twisted into the cordon the wire is. Um, I know from uh, driving around at the moment, I've seen some scenarios where the cordon has been cut and completely removed with wire and taken out of the vineyard for um, then a new fruiting wire to be put in place. Um, and varieties like Cabernet are particularly hard to work with in that, you know, they, once they grow through and they're very, you know, they're very hard to get, um, get rid of without taking the wire and everything. Um, but I, yeah, I guess it's, it's a case by case scenario. Um, but there's, you know, if you can, you know, if you can cut it out um, without taking out the wire, then definitely try it. All right, Nick, um, I think we might leave it there with regard to the Q&A. Um, we have got, okay, we've had someone ask this question twice, so I will ask it. Um, why are Bordeaux and Burgundy vines trained closer to the ground than what we commonly see in Australia? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I honestly, I don't think I could give you right now um, a really good answer to that question. Yeah. Um, no, I'd, I'd, I'd struggle right at the moment. Um, there are a number of questions here that are, are probably a little bit more technical in nature and I haven't addressed all of those. So um, for anyone that had a question that wasn't addressed here, then I do suggest you contact the AWRI's help desk team. Um, there's a number of viticulturists who will be able to address any of those more technical questions for you. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there, Nick. Did you want to make any final comments before we finish up? No, I just um, thanks everyone for, for your attendance. It's been a really enjoyable um, webinar and experience for myself. Great. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd just like to first extend a, a big thank you to Nick for um, providing some really key insights around this topic. Um, and also a thank you to everyone that joined today's session. Um, for all attendees, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording and there'll also be a link to view the video that was played in this session. Um, acknowledgements also to Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars by the AWRI Extension Project. Um, the next AWRI webinar is scheduled for Thursday the 25th of June uh, 2020. Uh, details are still to be confirmed. So please keep a lookout for more on that via the usual platforms. Um, thank you again. Uh, that's all we have for today. And I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.